Call to order. Meeting of the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District Board of Managers, September 27, 2018. Um, all managers are present, and I see no member of the public. So <coughs> we will move to item three, approval of the agenda. We're going to three. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. I'd like to make a, an amendment. Uh, second. I'd like, I'd like to remove uh, item 12.1. Redevelopment and sale of 325 Blake Road property. Apparently, staff don't have much of an update because they gave us a brief update at the at our committee hearing and said there was nothing more. And did I hear you a second, Andrew Becker? Um, any comment on the amendment? Those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, so the agenda as amended. <coughs> those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. We are good. Um, the consent agenda, I want to remove item 7.2 and add it to the bottom of the action items, which is just a small uh, comment to be made there. Is, with that change, are there any other changes? Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Mm -hmm. Andrew Shackleton, man, second by Miller. Uh, those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> and I normally list the uh, resolutions. They were 18.099 and... 18101 that were on the consent agenda. Um, President's report uh, in October there will be um, a meeting of Metro Mod, and I have lost track of my of who's assigned, but I'll catch up with that. And and Manager Rodmans is assigned to the Citizens Advisory Committee in October on the 10th. Right. Um, Mod uh, resolutions will be coming out to us about the, re the recommended ones about the middle of October. Um, so we're watching for that. And as of December, I'm going to be a MOD representative on the Local Government Water Roundtable. So I'm looking forward to that collaboration with um, counties and soil and water conservation districts. I'm sorry, Manager, what, you'll be the representative? Mm -hmm. okay. Going to succeed, Craig. Right. Congratulations. Thank you. That sounds kind of fun. I think it'll be great. Um, policy and uh, Planning Committee meeting report. Manager Miller. Uh, there was a, a short meeting uh, today in which we discussed a uh, uh, easement on kind of private uh, property that's uh, very complex and uh, it's on Bushway Road at, at the uh, causeway and it's it'd be about three acres of, uh, of easement but it's uh, it's a big site it's a 10 acre site so uh, we wanted the staff want, uh, gave us an update to make sure we were in sync on uh, on um, what was being offered and what we were going to require. So, and uh, we didn't have anything else on the agenda. Thank you. <coughs> the meetings are listed. Um, upcoming meetings on the agenda, and we'll go to item 11.1, .1, which is resolution 18102, approval of the main Trista local water management plan, Renee Clark. Managers, before you tonight is the City of Minnetrista's local water management plan. I will briefly <coughs>
framework as, we, as we've reviewed in the past is before you, and staff works to ensure that all these um, statutory and local plan, um, our plan requirements are included in the local water plan before they come before you. The miniature to local water plan summary, I'll provide a watershed orientation, um, which is a bit more complex than some. Um, with respect to the number of sub-watersheds in this geography, and then preview the highlights of the coordination plan, which is provided in your packet. First, Minatrista is located in lar a large part of the headwaters in the western part of the district. The city is 32 square miles, encompassing two watershed districts. Um, Minnehaha Creek watershed districts highlighted in blue, and it's 20 square miles of that total area with the <coughs> Pioneer Sarah Creek Watershed Management Commission being the remainder 12 square miles highlighted in green. Looking at the sub-watershed map of the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District, Minnetrista is highlighted in red again, and you'll see it encompasses portions of five different sub-watersheds. Um, including Lake Minnetonka, Dutch Lake, Landon Lake, and parts of two focal geographies, including Painter Creek Subwatershed and the Six Mile Creek Halstead Bay Subwatershed. <coughs> Minnetrista also drains to several impaired water bodies um, within the city, including Jennings Bay, Halstead Bay, Dutch Lake, and Painter Creek. Painter is impaired for E. coli, the remainder nutrients and then drains to several impaired waters outside city boundaries, which include Forest Lake of, and West Arm of Lake Minnetonka, Langdon, Harley, and Stone Lake. I'll quickly review the, diff the five different sub-watersheds. Each map has a red line, which is approximating the city boundary in that sub-watershed. In the Lake Minnetonka sub-watershed, the approximate city boundary is to the left of that red line. The issues from the district's plan for Lake Minnetonka, um, in summary, are excess nutrients for those impaired bays, some localized flooding and shoreline alteration. Um, key management strategies are addressing those impaired bays through upstream restoration in our local geographies, um, educating on best management practices for chlorides, which is in um, emerging issue for the um, impaired lakes as well as all of Lake Minnetonka. And then uh, CARP assessments for Jennings, West Arm, and Forest Lake have been um, flagged as a future activity in those bays. The Dutch Lake subwatershed includes um, most of Minnetrista, um, that part um, to the north of that red line at the bottom. Uh, Minnetrista bisects the lake itself. Um, issues for Dutch, again, excess nutrients from stream input, elevated chloride levels, and a degraded plant community. Management strategies here are to maintain the district's investment in the sand iron filter, um, treating some of that uh, stream input. Uh, carp assessment here as well. And again, education on chloride best management practices. Langdon Lake issues include nutrients and then protection of high quality wetlands and upland corridors. Management strategies, um, I'm flagging in this sub-watershed, which is true for all our sub-watersheds, uh, early coordination with land use planning and then opportunity driven stormwater management, um, primarily through again, regulatory coordination for those sub-watersheds which are not focal geographies. The Painter Creek sub-watershed, which is a future focal geography flagged in our plan. Um, excess nutrients, elevated E. coli levels in Painter Creek, and degraded and disconnected corridors in the sub-watershed. Here, Minnetrista is the area below the red line. Management strategies here are coordin coordination and planning with our partners to restore wetlands in the stream corridor, conserve um, the land and corridor connections and restore those corridor connections and then cart management has been flagged as a management strategy as well. The six mile Halstead Bay sub-watershed, 
the portion of that watershed approximately within Manitrista is the area north of the red line I've got drawn. With the exception of St. Bonifacius, which is harder to see on this map, but it's a square mile um, that excludes Manitrista. Places <coughs> in Halstead's Bay we're um, much more familiar with, um, including the modified hydrology in the subwatershed and the degraded and disconnected corridors. Management strategies, some are already underway in our park management, our wetland restoration, and the intense coordination of land use and water planning that my colleague, Ms. Brown, has been implementing with the city of Victoria. <coughs> the Minicosta <coughs> Local Water Management Plan um, partnership opportunities um, really call for uh, coordination of land use change and the coordination plan does flag some specific areas of coordination that are projected to be on the horizon, including some commercial development along Highway 7, build out the Hunter's Crest, as well as Woodland Cove, another developing area in the city. Um, the city has specifically uh, support, stated it supports the district as it pursues out outside funding for a shared implementation project for Six Mile Creek Halstead Bay um, through that partnership. And then um, the CIP does include watershed district investment priorities from our CIP. The coordination plan does indicate our annual um, meeting where we'll talk about these land use changes on the horizon and opportunities for coordination. Um, it goes into some details about regulatory coordination and early coordination of land use planning. Um, again, identifying some of those changes on the horizon as well as some of those capital investments including the Elm um, treatment station that we've been discussing with the city. So staff recommendation is approval of the Minitrista Local Water Management Plan. So Thank you. Is there a motion, Manager Olson? Is there a second? Second. Manager Shackleton, any questions for Ms. Clark? I noticed that there's a little reciprocity in there too that we'll be giving them information about our permitting activities and, <coughs> and they'll be giving us information about applications for land use. Correct. And we, um, with Minitrista um, regulatory coordination, to, you know, the major recent, recent major example, mm -hmm. we both recognize as a really big success and the benefits of that early coordination. Um, so we, you know, with these coordination plans, we're really trying to make these interactions more systematic mm -hmm. um, than, than relational and um, just establish a baseline of expectation. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Item 11.2 resolution. I just want to make a comment. Certainly. Those graphics were very good to understand, so thanks a lot for effort. Thank you. Resolution 18-103, um, Ms. Anna Brown. Piling or, fitting, or footing 
Um, and then the pilings or footings will be fit with precast concrete grates. So the grates and the chain link fence are the main components. Um, and the board will recall that the uh, precast grates are being designed in such a way that they can be raised and lowered to manage non carp fish species um, as well as manage <coughs> debris uh, in the channel. Um, this provides a, a closer look at the, those precast uh, barriers and the footings. Um, the, when I briefed the board uh, at the <coughs> September 13th meeting, we were looking at applying pilings um, at all three locations. Um, and we have since slightly modified the design to propose instead uh, concrete footings. This uh, provides some cost savings to the district without Im negatively impacting the integrity of the design. Um, so the concrete footings will be used at the um, Crown College and Wasserman sites. Um, and then at the Highland Road, we're going to be leaving it up to the contractor to determine the, the best approach on that site, whether it's concrete footings or pilings. There are two changes that I um, want to flag from the resolution of in your packet. Um, it doesn't impact the actual resolution. It's just some of the detail laid out uh, within the, the background of that uh, request for board action. Um, the first one being the approach to the quote package assembly. Um, in the RBA, it, it specified that we would be soliciting quotes as two separate packages, that Highland Road would be one quote solicitation, and Wasserman Crown would be another. Um, we've since decided to wrap them together as one package. Um, the primary motivation being that with two different packages, we might end up with different fabricators. So for consistency of design um, and operability, it makes sense to treat all the barriers the same. Um, and then the other change is that we are eliminating the alternate bid at the Highland Road uh, barrier site. So you'll recall that we were um, bidding one side of the barrier and then the other side would be um, a, a quote alternate. Um, at this time, the landowners on the side that would have been the alternate are not favorable to that sort of second barrier. Um, so we're currently evaluating alternate methods of trapping using just the one-sided barrier. Um, and we'll continue to see if we can make headway with these landowners, but um, it, it won't happen this fall, and so we'll just advance the, the one side um, as we can. Um, then I also detailed in the RBA the estimated costs and would just note that these are consistent with the costs that were um, within our work plan for the Lassard Sands um, grant activity. Can, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, what's the problem with the landowner? Um, they're concerned about the removal of the fish. They don't want the carp removed? Yes, they're concerned about the... Timeliness of the removal. They don't want a lot of dead fish adjacent to their property. Oh. It, it's sort of more of a ethical consideration for them. Mm -hmm. So it, it might be, you know, it's, it'll be an ongoing conversation. I just think it's going to take more time and um, probably not going to happen this fall. Uh, if, uh, do we have to... We could, we could use condemnation if we need to. Uh, would that be considered? It seems like it's a little further down the road than... Well, you know, I want to make sure that we're spending this money um, on, a, on a major effort. I want to make sure it's as complete and efficient and effective as we can make it. Manager Miller, I do think that there there are some other options for being able to trap and remove the fish at the site. Um, one option that we're looking into is um, the use of an electric barrier, which is something that other watershed districts are, um, are working with, and that's something that's a little bit more mobile, and it's essentially used to guide the fish to a specific location, and then you can remove them from there. So it might be that you can sort of create that two-sided barrier concept using an electric barrier um, that's a little more mobile and a little easier to um, use in a confined space. 
Um, and we'll continue to look at whether there are other things we haven't thought of yet for, for how we might trap. And I, I certainly don't think that the door is entirely closed. Um, there might be something that we sort of haven't thought of. But it certainly makes sense to get one side in now, particularly since Six Mile Creek is, is sort of a super highway for park right now. And mm -hmm. we'd like to you know, stop them from coming from Halstead Bay as soon as we can. Um, and then we'll sort of evaluate options and, and work adaptively. Uh, Thank I'm, you. I'm, I'm kind of confused with, uh, with the answer. You're putting in a half barrier? Um, so the original proposal was that we would have a barrier on either side um, and that it would be used to sort of trap the fish under the bridge. A barrier um, on the upstream and downstream, not either side of the channel. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, either side of the road. Okay. Bridge, the bridge. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm it's fine. a complete barrier. Because it, it wouldn't take them much to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand why that would be okay. Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> we only want the right fish. <laughs> Not the left fish. Um, so, the proposed timeline would be um, soliciting quotes uh, middle of next week. Um, there, the uh, Respondents would have two weeks total, um, and we would have an optional site meeting at the Halstead or at the Halstead Drive location, uh, or sorry, Highland Road location, at uh, the week of October eighth through twelfth, because that is the one that's sort of the most complicated. Um, so we'd have a, a chance for contractors to see that site. We'd be then awarding contract on a <coughs> contract at the October twenty fifth board meeting, um, and then their deadline to install would be. March 15th, which very conservatively ensures that we are have them in place for that spring migration. Andrew Olson? So, going back to the bridge, we do have the ability to put it on one side? Yes, yeah, so one side. Which of side? Um, so, it's the downstream side of the Halstead's Bay side yes. of the road. That one is okay for now. So, we would have a challenge of pulling out trapped fish that are adjacent to the bridge. Right, so the question is, it will certainly be an effective cart barrier. It's how can we um, <clears throat> then identify a way to also trap and remove them from the channel um, with a sort of secondary barrier or an electric option or okay. something we haven't thought of yet. Okay, thank you. Are you ready for yes. us? Okay. Um, let me first then have a a motion to adopt resolution 18103, which is approval of the plans and specifications and authorization to solicit quotes. So moved. Manager Olson, is there a second? Second. Manager Rognes. Any further questions or discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, 
in November of 2017, the board awarded a design contract with Wank Associates to develop a preliminary concept plan for the park um, in coordination with the city. And a component of that scope of work was to uh, develop additional feasibility and specifications for alum treatment within that pond. Um, at the, the same time that that feasibility work was unfolding, the district was participating um, in the clean water pilot program uh, process with both Hennepin and Carver counties, um, working through Bowser to uh, figure out a funding allocation for um, resources within each of those counties. Um, and through the Carver County process, the district was positioned and, and is positioned to receive $93,000 in funding um, through that collaborative process. Um, so the district, through that process, identified alum treatment um, within this site as a, a, a primary candidate for the funding, um, and that proposal was accepted by Bowser. So, uh, this alum treatment will be funded through the Bowser Clean Water uh, Pilot Program. Um, a majority of the funding will be applied to the alum treatment on site, um, and there will also be some funding applied to a stream restoration uh, in the, the southern edge of the site that it will that is still being designed. Um, the implementation schedule, uh, the uh, alum treatment will occur over a sort of three-year time period um, with a possible maintenance dose in some horizon in the, the five years that follow. So uh, the first year will be the first alum treatment, which we're proposing for um, this fall yet. Um, year two is a sort of a year off. We'll be monitoring the site. And then in year three, there will be a secondary treatment. Um, the district will also be expected We'll need to budget for um, some maintenance dose within the sort of two to five years that follow. Um, so just to put a finer point on it, those year one and three treatments will be funded through the Bowser Clean Water Pilot Program, um, but that maintenance dose will fall outside of the grant window, so that will be a district obligation. The estimated costs for these alum treatments are that in year one and three, uh, the cost will be um, about 34000 pending uh, pending quotes, and then the maintenance dose should cost around 15000 um, Again, in order to sort of conservatively make sure that both that primary and then the secondary treatment can occur within the three-year grant window, we are proposing to do that first treatment in the fall. Um, so we are looking to uh, award the contract for the alum treatment um, at the October 25th board meeting, apply the preliminary treatment in November of this year. Um, the only thing that would prevent that treatment is if we have a sudden cold snap and the pond were to drastically drop in temperature, then we would have to reserve the treatment until the spring, um, which would still allow us to do the full work within the grant period. Um, it's just sort of our, our backup plan. Um, and then the second the secondary treatment would occur in 2020. Um, and then finally, we have until December December of 2021 um, to fully apply that out of treatment uh, to be eligible for those grant funds. So with that, I can go any questions. Manager Olson. The, um, you, you mentioned water temperature. Uh, the alum, when you dose it, is bonding with the phosphorus that's suspended in the water, as well as settling to the bottom. What does the cold water issue do? Does it settle out phosphorus that we really want to bond with, or does it? We yeah. might call on our alum yeah. expert, <laughs> Mr. Beck, <laughs> our resident alum. There we go. <laughs> the alum whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> the alum whisperer. Rest of my board managers. Uh, the, the only thing that's limiting is if it drops below uh, 40 degrees, the formation of the solid doesn't happen as effectively. So essentially, when you wanted to form a clock or a, a mm -hmm. white substance, um, that would happen less quickly. And or effectively. Or, okay. or effectively. So that's okay. the reason why you want to. Thank you.
Street. Is there a motion to adopt Resolution 18-104? So moved. Manager Olson, is there a second? Second. Manager Rodkins, any further discussion or questions? Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you both. What's the size of the pond? The six acres. Eight. We'll now take up item 7.2. Uh, council had pointed out something that's perhaps we're not accustomed to, and I would like to turn to you, Mr. Welsh, to mention what that is. <coughs> Manager White, managers, this is a very brief item um, in this grant agreement, which is boilerplate from the state, uh, very similar to past year's grant agreements, and have uh, seen a number of them with a number of our different clients, and certainly with the district has entered a number of these grant agreements. Sometime recently, and we haven't dug into the history of this, Bowser added a provision in Section 5 with regard to conditions of payment calling for a potential penalty of up to 150% of the grant agreement amount for uh, non-compliance with the, with the work or the work is found to be Bowser to be unsatisfactory or performed in violation of law. Um, this provision, I would argue, is, is, is and, and find to be against public policy, uh, probably unenforceable. Very, very low risk for the district because you wouldn't get the grant and you wouldn't seek the grant if you weren't going to do the work in a satisfactory manner. So I don't recommend any change in the resolution that staff has brought forward, but wanted to bring this provision to the manager's attention. I contacted Bowser about it and we're sort of gently suggesting that this might be a thing that's not very friendly in the first instance and not necessary and not enforceable. So it's a discussion item with them that uh, one of our other clients has asked us to have. So we'll report back Thank on you. how that concludes. So just an information item for the managers tonight. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt Resolution 18 uh, 100? Move approval. Manager Miller, is there a second? Second. Manager Shackleton, any questions for Mr. Welsh or otherwise? Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Um, comment? Yes. Uh, between 7.2 and 7.3, you can include 7.1, there's almost a little over $900,000 worth of successfully uh, obtained grant money, which is a, really a commendable accomplishment on the part of our staff to, to uh, go for that kind of funding, and it's something that we've encouraged over the last five years, and it's just a, a, a great thing to see other third parties recognizing the good work that they're doing. Thank you for pointing that out, Manager Olson. I, I think it should, it should uh, also note that it's been uh, uh, since uh, Manager Becker has been on the board that we've been successful. I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll go to the administrator's report. Good timing. Yeah. President White, managers, um, we briefed the board and committee that um, we're still working on the strategic action plan. So the, the three big elements in the operations committee, ITHR, accounting finance, Planning Committee, uh, the regulation, our responsive CIP, our policy program and strategic communications. We're dialing in the priorities and the order in which that will happen and, and working with staff to create some clarity there and that will be forthcoming. So you can look forward to that. Um, and then the next thing to jump into a water level update and since Tiffany is here tonight and I always stumble through it and you can rattle it off the tip of your tongue. Maybe you want to give us a quick update. We'd sent out some high level um, high water level warnings under sort of a different format recently. I think we got a good reception from from the, the recipients of that, but maybe you want to talk a little bit about where we're at with Nicomas, Grays Bay, yes. forthcoming rain fall events. Yes, so to James' point, um, we did take on a new format for sending out high water level updates, so I hopefully you guys all received yep. that. If you didn't, let me know. But yeah, that was well received and people really liked um, the look of that, so we'll keep on with that. Um, so I'll start downstream and head up. So um, Lake Nokomis, unfortunately the city of Minneapolis got a lot more rain than our upper watershed. They got almost five inches. So um, we've been dry, the weir's been closed, not needed to outlet. 
but now that lake almost jumped a foot. So the weir was opened up yes, um, on Tuesday morning and the water is discharging out, but it will be closed um, in the next few days because there's an inch to inch and a half of rain predicted Monday through Wednesday. So to make sure the creek doesn't go into there and then we'll try to keep opening that up and as, as the forecast allows. Um, Lake Minnetonka jumped a little bit. Um, yesterday we were sitting at 928.88, which is kind of ideal for where we'd like to be this time of year, but with that inch and a half predicted, um, we increased the discharge yesterday just to temporarily try to create capacity and plan to um, reduce that tomorrow afternoon to help the creek um, get, gain some capacity ahead of that rain. The creek is currently flowing around 175 CFS down on um, Hiawatha Avenue. And then the last thing I'll note is Mooney Lake's another one that we actually keep an eye on with high water levels. And um, technically in October 1, if they're above a certain elevation, they can start pumping, which they are at. So that'll be pumping um, starting next week as well to try to, re to create storage capacity in that lake. So. Manager Olson. Oh, he, Manager he, just a quick question. You mentioned pumping, and um, I, I saw a rumor online that the Minneapolis Park Board turned off their pumps at Hiawatha. And that there were a couple uh, fairways, at least, that were underwater. Um, my sense was that I just I did not ask anybody at the park board whether they turned on, on or off their pumps. And um, I know that there was a lot of rain that fell. Yeah, Manager Shackleton, to my knowledge, I hadn't heard that, but I could very well have happened. Okay. Yeah. Did I read your report right that said that the water going over the falls was around 600? Manager Olson, yes, that is correct. So at Hiawatha, we have a real-time gauge, and that measured 609, um, which was a significant jump from that morning when it was only flowing at 75. So, um, yeah, they recorded, it was a daily record, so it recorded 3.28 inches. Is it, how much, do we ever have a feel for how much the maximum that ever went over the falls? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in 2014, we measured 889. How much? 889. Cubic yeah, feet was, per second. Yeah, and that's well above the 100 year that was getting yeah. close to, the, I think, the 500 oh. year is, flow. Is that when the guy went over the, over the falls? <laughs> no. It was less than that when he yeah. paddled? Okay. I don't think he would have turned out well if he went over that. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised it didn't. Yeah. He like broke his nose. <laughs> he would have needed a barrel. I think, I think he did. With this rain, uh, the other day, I, w I went over to the Chapels and Ponds. I couldn't believe the amount of water running into that, off that building. It is just unbelievable. Heretofore, it would just go right into the creek. And those two ponds filled up, and it took a couple of days for them to drain down. Now, uh, that second pond, is that just naturally uh, in, uh, integrated into the ground, or is it run out? There's, it's a filter media with tile, so that discharges east into that, okay. into the preserve well, area, preserve. into that wetland. And the, the, the first, uh, first one was deep. It was, so, um, uh, it'd probably be, I, I wonder how many uh, more cubic uh, feet that would add to the falls if, uh, if uh, we didn't have, uh, you know, for that, uh, Protection for Chris has already got his calculator out running. <laughs> <laughs> so 30, 30 acres, about three inches already. It, 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 it all goes helpful. Well, you'd, you'd have to add in because uh, the the main officer was was uh, full too. Uh, so that was that's a lot of water kept on uh, kept out of the creek for at least for, during the storm. You should, look at, you should look at the chart online, the USGS chart. It's just kind of, yeah. <laughs> it's like just a straight vertical line. Thank you, Ms. Shelfer. Yep, thank you. And thank so you. Um, we get some good feedback. I was kindly invited to join uh, Hennepin County City Managers Group that um, City Manager from St. Louis Park, Tom Harmoning, organizes recently. And um, he'd introduced me to the group and spoke really favorably to the, to the whole group of communities that are involved about the watershed district's efforts for dam management and flood mitigation and the communications and just how much of an improvement that they've noticed over the last several years. So that was good feedback. Um, and at that meeting, just um, anecdotally here, the communities went around and reported on projected tax levy. And so I thought I'd just let people know. The general range for most of the communities in the room was somewhere between four or 5%. Um, Hopkins, um, 
got the the record for the highest. I think they were competing in the in the room nine and a half percent. Maple Grove was one point six because they've got a running down toward the end of a bond issuance that they did for their uh, city campus. So um, I think we're in we're in good shape in terms of the the budget and the levy that the watershed district set. Um, for construction bidding, um, Tiffany's putting out the bid next Monday for the FEMA repairs. Um, and the pond dredging projects, those will go out together, and that's the Bidet McCoska. I always have trouble saying that, and the Pamela Ponds. And then the construction contracts for that will be back um, in the end of October for board consideration on October 25th. Um, Mike gave an update, I think, in committee on where we are with demolition. Um, we didn't get the videos. But we'll get those to you. The the base bid portion of the work's complete, so that first phase of the building is out of the way and out of the way of the road. So we hit our timeline for county road construction that the city's managing. So that's great. All the asbestos abatement, with um, with the exception of what's left within the walls, has been finished. We're on schedule, no delays. We're in good shape on budget, and we should have the whole thing down end of October. Um, early November, which is when they'll start pulverizing everything and creating the class five aggregate from the, the material that's left on site. So we're in good shape there. And the, the great news is we're finding a lot of clean sand or, or hopefully clean sand, but just a lot of sand material on site, which will be able to be used for the, the redevelopment. And I know our demolition contractor is very interested in if we want to hang on to that or if they can take it with them. So I think that there's some, there's some money there in that sand. Where's the um, sand? Is it under the floor or what? It's under the whole facility. I mean, the building that they've taken out, it's, I don't know how deep it is and if we've done borings or anything, but. Yeah, so the sand is actually, if you've ever noticed, the building is actually elevated, so the main floor is up at the truck dock, and, and there's two layers of concrete with cork in between those layers, and those run about a foot and a half or so, and then below that is two to three feet of sand that was used to bring that concrete up. Uh -huh. It also goes underground another two or three feet. Um, so they're figuring out, you know, six feet of clean wow. material that was brought in on a, you know, 200 plus thousand square foot facility. So Did you say cork? Well, there's cork sandwiched between the concrete for insulation. Okay. Yeah. Is that standard? Well, that was that, what, I mean, was that standard, was that standard <laughs> insulatory in material? In a freezer facility, yes. That's also what the effect is. <laughs> it's in the tar. So, yeah. Not on the floor. Otherwise, you have 53 degree temperature warming everything up. It just, it, it's just fascinating. I would have presumed there would have been some sort of batting, but, yeah. but cork. Yeah. Okay. See? A <laughs> um, couple notes here on presentations. The boards wanted to stay updated on the presentations and kind of community connections that we're making. Um, and I'd reported back and distributed the presentation from the National APA, the Water Plan and Connect Conference in Kansas City. We had um, Anna Brown, Renee Clark were kind enough to drive back for today's meeting, but they were down in Rochester with Becky at the regional APA, and they presented today, and uh, Becky is presenting tomorrow, and I don't know if you want to give a, a quick update. It's, I've got a series of other presentations that we're working on, but it sounds like we got a pretty warm reception, a good turnout at the first one, and Becky is presenting on a comprehensive plan tomorrow. Sure, so I'll, I'll keep it brief. So uh, Renee and I did present today the Upper Midwest Regional Planning Association in um, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, and I think one or both of the Dakotas, although uh, the audience is largely from Minnesota. Um, and we presented on sort of a, sort of a look at how our um, model of land use and water integration has been uh, applied specifically in the context of recreation and park planning. Uh, so we provided some background on, um, on our model, on the way that we do work, on some of the recent accomplishments, and then looked at um, this sort of park and recreation through the lens of the Greenway, Cottageville Park, um, and then some of the work in Six Mile, both the, the work with the city of Victoria to develop a broad greenway plan in their growth area, um, and then the specific opportunity emerging on Walker and West. Um, so it was a highly attended uh, session. I think the room, was, the room was pretty full. Lots of heads nodding, so I'll take that as a, an endorsement. And uh, yeah, I think it, it went well. It was a, 
sort of a new presentation for our group, and I think we'll sort of incorporate that into our um, into our foray. Thank you. Could you make a presentation to the, to the uh, planning committee uh, on what you gave to the city planners? Sure. Yeah. That would be great because I think it'd be helpful to all have the same message and understanding. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Yeah, Thank you. Good. Yeah, I think that's starting to go well. You know, once you get into the, the presentation circuit, it, it's the message that we're trying to deliver. We're custom tailoring for each specific conference, but it's the same, you know, balanced urban ecology message. And I think it's really starting to serve to establish the district as a policy expert in the region on water and land use planning, um, which is really what we want for when we start asking for requests to make policy change, whether it's a local level or a regional level. And a couple of other interesting connections here are happening just late this week, right before the meeting. Elk River, um, they have a sister city uh, in Germany um, that is coming to tour the area, and they reached out and they want to use the preserve um, and learn about sustainability and the watershed model in Minnesota and the watershed districts approach. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, the Marvin Johnson's been kind enough on several different occasions to connect us to the National League of Cities. So if you recall, Renee presented on a boat tour with um, the small cities group and talked about our model. And that's been parlayed into connections with their director of sustainability um, uh, for federal advocacy. So one of their senior lobbyists in, in Washington that's working on the Energy, Environment, Natural Resource Policy Committee. They're having a meeting coming up with NOAA, EPA, Department of Ag, and a couple of others, and they've been connected with us and are asking questions about our model and how we get work done in the region. Um, Prior Lake, Spring Lake, just this week, I know we were talking about the, the Allen conversation. Their staffs reach out and is interested in our model and wants us to go present it there and maybe talk to their board. And then uh, just after I stepped out of committee, I had a voicemail I connected with Paul Moline from Carver County uh, Water Management Organization. They're doing a staff retreat coming up October 8th. They would like us to present to their staff about how we used to do work, how we're doing it now, what it means for Carver County. So um, we're definitely getting out there, and people are now proactively re requesting to hear a message. I think that's really a good sign of progress. Um, regarding MOD, I think... Um, President White, you, you covered this, but just as a reminder, I did issue uh, a call for folks that are interested in going to the MOD conference um, for reservations. The, everything's kind of booked up now. We'd heard from President White and Manager Olson, so those are the folks that will be, that will be going to MOD um, November 29th through December 1st. And then Becky and I will be up there as well, and um, Becky's been invited to present on our comprehensive plan, so we'll get the message out there too. Um, and then I think you mentioned Metro MOD. Is that right? Um, the agenda will be coming out October 8th. The meeting's on the 16th, and it's a capital region. Um, other than that, the only other note, um, several months ago we talked in committee uh, about just getting out and networking and communicating with uh, Minnetonka area communities. I think President White, Manager Loftus, Olson, and I had connected on that. And I just wanted to let the, the board members know it hasn't slipped from my radar. I'm just trying to find time where we can actually schedule those meetings so you can look for that in the coming weeks. We'll start getting out there and setting those meetings up. Thank you. And that is what I what I have for you tonight unless there's questions. Any questions? Thank you. We are adjourned.